Hi, everyone. This Core IM episode will count for CME credit with the American College of Physicians. We'll link the URL in the show notes. So follow the link, complete three questions and get CME credit. And without further ado, cue the intro. Picture this scenario. You get called or paged by the lab at 9 p.m. with a critical lab result of an elevated potassium level. Darn those late night outpatient lab calls. Yeah. So what do you do with that potassium in the outpatient setting? Yeah. So usually when I get those speeches for hyperkalemia, my first instinct is to flip through the chart to see if this has ever happened before. Kind of hoping that I can just do whatever the last person did to make the potassium better. Yeah. But either way, if you're calling a patient late at night about their potassium, assuming they even answer the phone, you better know what you're going to do about it. Right. That's so true. And I can definitely remember one specific time when I got a page about a potassium of 6.2 for a brand new patient with CKD. When I called, she was actually at Fenwell Hall, which is a food market here in Boston, and she was getting ready to have some baked potatoes with her family. It took a lot of convincing for her to get to the emergency room and to put the potato down. Exactly. So let's explore the very practical questions around hyperkalemia. Welcome to Mind the Gap. I'm Jeff William, a nephrologist at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. And I'm Larissa Kruger Gomez, currently a nephrologist at a private practice in Rhode Island and former fellow at the IDMC. So, what's on deck for today? First, we'll ask who needs to come into the emergency department for hyperkalemia. Or, simply put, how high is too high? Then, we'll get into if we should really be recommending a low potassium diet in patients with hyperkalemia. And finally, what are the potassium reducing strategies we can use for our outpatients? Okay. So say it's 9 p.m. and this potassium came back at 6.2. Do you call the patient tonight and recommend that they come to the ED? Or do you feel okay with them going to sleep blissfully unaware of their elevated potassium level? Again, how high is too high? Mm, Yeah, I think we all have our own comfort levels about potassium. Oh yeah, for sure. And probably different comfort levels depending on how many high K levels you've managed before. But what do the guidelines say, Jeff? Well, the KDGO guidelines acknowledge that the evidence is thin and the issues aren't well studied. So the guidelines suggest we should urgently refer any outpatient that falls into one of two buckets. The first bucket is to refer urgently for any potassium greater than six with or without EKG changes. What do you think about this, Larissa? Yeah, that's straightforward enough. K greater than six equals ED for you. Yeah, for me too. So the second bucket includes those with any degree of hyperkalemia and documented EKG changes. How about this one, Alyssa? Yeah, this one's a little confusing to me. So let's say, for example, I have someone with a newly elevated potassium at 5.8. Am I okay to schedule a close follow-up or should I send them to the ED? Ah, yes, that is the question. If the patient's at home, we obviously can't check an EKG. The guidelines aren't really helpful at all here with new hyperkalemia less than six. So we're kind of left to our clinical judgment? Yeah, well, my interpretation of the guidelines is that I should get an EKG for any patient with new onset hyperkalemia. But I can also tell you that lots of nephrologists and internists would probably disagree with what to do with a potassium less than six. Mm -hmm. So, Jeff, we keep bringing up the EKG. So I have to mention another frustration of mine. Hear me out. The main reason why we send patients to the ED is because we're worried not about the potassium per se, but because hyperkalemia can lead to cardiac instability, right? Right. All right. So what about the patients you send to the ED with a K greater than 6, but when they get to the hospital, they have absolutely no EKG changes? They would just do a bunch of work for nothing? Mm, Yeah, I hear you. But let's take a couple of steps back here. The way I think about EKGs in this setting is kind of like a biopsy. You can have sampling errors. So just because you're not seeing EKG changes right now doesn't mean that something would not have been present before or might be there in the very near future. Okay, so is there a potassium level cutoff that can help us predict EKG changes? There was a retrospective study that compared the EKG findings of three different cohorts. Mild hyperkalemia with a K less than 5.9, severe hyperkalemia with a K greater than 7, and a moderate hyperkalemia group with a K between six and seven. Mm -hmm. So were there any differences between the three potassium groups? They found no significant difference in the frequency of EKG changes between the mild and moderate hyperkalemia groups. 
As a refresher, that included all patients with Ks less than seven. Wow. And uh, is there anything else that surprised you about this study? Yeah. So even when they looked at every patient in the study, including those severely hyperkalemic ones with the Ks greater than seven, more than half of them didn't have any EKG changes. Wow. That's pretty much a coin toss. Yeah. So basically, the study authors couldn't really pinpoint a threshold at which you would see an EKG change at all. But they did note that the higher the K, the more likely it was that you'd see an EKG change. So the takeaway here is something we've all experienced. The absence of EKG changes in a patient with hyperkalemia is actually really common. I see. That's so weird. I was really expecting more of an association between potassium and EKG changes. Yeah, me too. And to drive this point home, check out this case report from Japan. This 77-year-old man with acute on chronic kidney injury comes in with a potassium of 8.5, and his EKG was normal. So they treated him, they adjusted his meds, and they sent him home with a normal potassium. But then he comes back six days later, and his potassium is back up to 8.6. But this time his EKG shows the scary-looking sine wave pattern. Wow, that's a really interesting case. What I take away from this is that the absolute potassium level alone doesn't matter as much as how quickly you got there. Exactly. That change from normal kalemia to a level of 8.6 was where this patient ran into trouble. For me, any abrupt change from normal to hyperkalemia is worrisome and needs to be treated. Okay, so all of these points definitely make sense for the new acute hyperkalemia. But what about those patients who always have an elevated potassium when you check it as an outpatient? The so-called chronic hyperkalemia. What should we do for them? Well, the guidelines acknowledge that the higher the K, the higher the risk of cardiac instability. But these guidelines don't address what chronic really means. There's no consensus on how high or how long the potassium needs to be abnormal to be called chronic. Mm, that's a lot of gray area. Yep. That's why it's a Mind the Gap episode. Yeah. I guess for me, in this chronic hyper-K cases, I still apply the same principle we discussed for acute hyperkalemia. I look at the delta between the last potassium and the one I have now. For example, if someone has been 5.6 for a while, and now they're 5.8, that's not a lot of change. But if someone has been 5.6, it's now 6.2, I'll think about it differently. Okay, so let's recap what we discussed so far. If somebody's potassium is greater than 6, especially if it's an abrupt change, they should have a stat recheck, an EKG, and prompt treatment. But what about hyperkalemia less than 6? Well, it just hasn't been well studied, but should be taken seriously if a patient's potassium has quickly jumped from a normal level. And the higher the K, the more likely you are to see the classic EKG changes of hyperkalemia. But there isn't really a potassium cutoff where you know for sure you run into trouble with instability of cardiac myocytes. Okay, so based on the guidelines, Larissa, you've sent your baked potato-loving patient with CKD and a potassium of 6.2 to the emergency department. The EKG is checked, but doesn't show any changes. The repeat potassium is 5.4 without intervention. Ah, uh, how frustrating. It happens all the time. Yep, so she's sent home with close outpatient follow-up. Jeff, that's a big improvement without any intervention. Was it magic? Hmm, magic. Mm, probably not. It sounds like a case of pseudo-hyperkalemia to me. When the lab measures and reports hyperkalemia, but the patient's actual circulating potassium is normal. But wait, 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 wait. The lab did not say that the sample was hemolyzed. Mm, well, just because the lab didn't report the sample as hemolyzed, it doesn't mean there wasn't some extra K released. Our cells are full of potassium, right? So if they get damaged at all during the phlebotomy process, extra potassium is released within the blood collection tube, even if this is below the level that the lab considers the sample to be hemolyzed. Yeah. Whenever a patient tells me they're a tough stick, I wonder if I'll get called about their potassium later. There are just so many opportunities for pseudo-hyperkalemia during a difficult blood draw. There's fist clenching, taking the tourniquet on and off, and vein trauma from multiple phlebotomy attempts. Right. And the lab routinely measures electrolytes using a serum separator tube. When a clot forms in this tube, more potassium is actually released from the red blood cells and into the serum inside that tube. True. This is why your best bet in those cases is to actually send a whole blood sample to measure your potassium. This way, the lab will use a tube with an anticoagulant and no clot formation happens. So, no potassium sneaking out. 
Yeah, getting the whole blood K is my go-to also. Okay, so your patient with CKD now has a K of 5.4 when she comes back to the clinic. Are you going to counsel her on a low potassium diet now? So actually, no. I would start by asking her to share her diet with me. Usually I start with a 24-hour recall of whatever they ate recently. You know what? I definitely do this, but it doesn't always reveal one of those classic high potassium foods like bananas. True. And bananas get actually a bad rap for being high potassium food. But don't forget the other common fruits like oranges, mangoes, avocados, melon, prunes, raisins, and dates. All of those have potassium too. Right. So many of these potassium-rich fruits and veggies are actually an important part of a healthy diet. And this is where I really struggle when I counsel patients. I definitely don't want my patients to be hyperkalemic, but I feel really badly about telling them to stop eating a healthy diet. Let's hear more from Dr. Shivam Joshi. He's a nephrologist at NYU whose research focuses on nutrition and kidney disease. It's not worth going through all this to explain to them and creating all this nutritional confusion. I think this should be used uh, strategically and not universally. Nutritional confusion. Yeah, I can certainly see that happening. Telling patients to restrict all these foods or measure how much potassium is in this or in that. For the most part, I try to steer away from the traditional logic of just restricting all plant foods, that all plant foods have potassium, all plant foods will raise your potassium level. Thus, we should restrict plant foods in patients with kidney disease. I think that doesn't make sense. It's not evidence-based. We're starting to get research suggesting that maybe potassium functions in the same way as phosphorus, and there's a bioavailability aspect that not all the phosphorus or potassium going in is, is reflexively absorbed. People are saying that plant foods have cell walls and that because of those cell walls, potassium is contained in it, which makes it harder to digest and then ultimately be absorbed. Okay. I see. So just because a food has a lot of potassium doesn't mean we actually absorb all of it. Yep. And actually, a high potassium diet has been linked to things we love seeing in our patients, like better blood pressure, improved cardiovascular mortality, and the dream, decreased rates of CKD. Yeah. And to me, as a nephrologist, what I find so interesting is the mechanism behind high potassium intake and blood pressure control. When you eat lots of potassium, there are potassium sensors on the renal tubular epithelial cells that will inactivate the thiazide sensitive channel. So basically a high potassium diet is like taking a thiazide diuretic. You'll pee out more volume and the blood pressure gets better. So Jeff, is the opposite also true? Low potassium in the diet leads to worse blood pressure outcomes? Definitely. A low potassium diet results in increased sodium reabsorption and worsening blood pressure control. In fact, a low potassium diet has been associated with progression of chronic kidney disease, the exact opposite of what we're trying to accomplish for our patients. Yeah, those are great pathophys nuggets to keep in mind. My other nugget for why I'm not a fan of counseling patients on a low potassium diet is that fruits and veggies actually provide a lot of alkali. As Megan Trainer once said, you know I'm all about that base. <laughs> she did say that, but I'm not sure we're talking about the same base. Hmm. Okay, maybe not, but increased alkali with fruits and veggies definitely counteracts the metabolic acidosis of CKD. Remember, we don't like metabolic acidosis. It actually worsens hyperkalemia. Yeah, and we will link to an article in the show notes about the pathophys between potassium and hydrogen channels if you want to read more. Yep, and metabolic acidosis is also associated with worsening CKD and higher mortality. So I have learned not to underestimate a low bicarb in a patient with hyperkalemia. I think that gets missed a lot. And then the other thing is metabolic acidosis. I can tell you the number of times I've been referred hyperkalemia management in renal clinic and their average bicarb is 10 or 14. And we're not correcting the bicarb. Yeah, that's really low. But I am even giving bicarb when it's in the 18s and 20s. All right. I hope we sold people on not going too, too crazy on the low potassium diet. Jeff. Is there anything else as far as diet that we didn't mention and you ask your patients about? Yeah, definitely. I also double check that they haven't replaced their salt intake with a salt substitute. Those salts are usually potassium chloride, exactly the electrolyte we're trying to avoid here. And I also ask about sauces, juices, and smoothies. These are big problems too. Think about all those fruits you need to make a juice or a smoothie, way more than what you would actually eat. 
Dr. Joshi still remembers a case where Juice was a player in a sudden potassium bump. I remember rounding on her and her potassium had suddenly increased. And as I entered her room, there was all these juice containers, you know, your one cup sized, uh, the, the foil on top and you peel it back. And she loved cranberry juice and all these containers were just thrown in the trash can. And I think it's because she didn't like water. There wasn't anything else for her to drink. So the entire day before and evening before she was just drinking all this cranberry juice that will always uh, stick with me. Yeah, that's a good story. And here's another ding against juices versus the whole fruit. Often people are using some juicers and blenders that just take out all of that healthy fiber. And everyone knows that a low fiber diet can cause constipation and, fun fact, that can affect potassium as well. There is some research to suggest that with declining kidney function, that you can get an increase in colonic secretion of potassium. This is not established or some studies that don't show this. but If it does happen, you cannot get the benefit of it if you're not having a bowel movement. So one of the questions I asked, are they constipated? Some people think that the benefit of K-exalate is actually just because it induced a bowel movement and it was a laxative. Yeah. And in addition to make sure we've got good flow with what's going out by taking care of constipation, we got to make sure enough is going in. I will say that uh, fasting can also raise potassium levels because of the lack of insulin being used to, with eating. So sometimes if someone's fasting, you may get a little bit of hyperkalemia with that. Yeah, you can definitely notice that in AM labs in the hospital sometimes, which is yet another reason why just repeating a potassium sometimes helps. Hey, Jeff, do you have any other good dietary tips for limiting potassium intake, but still eating a healthy diet? Sure. So for your potato-loving patient, you can ask her to leach them. Leaching means cutting the potatoes into smaller pieces, soaking them in water, boiling them, and then draining them to get out that potassium. The leaching process will get rid of about half the potassium content. Hey, Larissa, time for a recap? Yeah. So as far as diet, no one size fits all here. Individualized counseling is the way to go. Look for those culprits of high potassium foods that don't give you the dietary benefits like juices and smoothies. And ask about constipation and fasting. All right, so what about the meds? So we have to talk about RAS inhibitors here. Yes, they can all lead to hyperkalemia. And yes, we often instinctively stop them in the face of acute hyperkalemia. This is probably a good thing, just like when we stop them for AKI. But when should we restart them? Oh, I see so many patients in clinic with CKD and diabetes who've been taken off their RAS inhibitor during a recent hospital stay. The discharge summary says, Follow up with your doctor about restarting your lisinopril. Yep, I've definitely written that in my discharge summaries as a resident. And I think we're all trying to do the right thing here. We all know that RAS inhibitors improve mortality and slow the progression of CKD. Absolutely. I can't stress this enough. This question is settled. RAS inhibitors save lives. But for patients with hyperkalemia, so many are on diuretics, but not RAS inhibitors. That's just not a fair trade. It would be like, trading Pat Mahomes away for, for like Tom Brady. You know, it might seem like a good idea right now, but it's not going to help you five to 10 years from now. What? What? Too, too soon? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I've been in New England for a few years now, and I'm still not quite sure about how to talk about Tom Brady. Um, anyways, does the potassium always come down when you stop the ACE inhibitor? Not always. The teaching point here is that there are different driving forces for each individual's potassium balance. For example, patients with diabetes are more likely to develop hyperkalemia. Ooh, yes. I actually didn't know this before my nephrology fellowship, and we definitely see this a lot. How does that work again, Jeff? So there are two reasons for this. The first is that diabetic patients start out with lower levels of insulin or higher insulin resistance. So the insulin surge that these patients with diabetes get after a meal isn't as robust. Less insulin less intracellular potassium shift, and more potassium is left circulating around. I also think a lot of people don't know that some patients with diabetes are in a hyporenin, hypoaldosterone state. Ah, yes, the so-called type 4 RTA. Those low aldosterone levels make the kidney much less efficient at excreting potassium. So let's say your patient has diabetic nephropathy, they're on a RAS inhibitor, and in this hypoaldo state. That's basically a recipe for hyperkalemia. Long story short, We cannot predict how much the RAS inhibitor is contributing to the potassium balance. 
each patient is a different story. So, Larissa, we talked a bit about RAS inhibitors, but what else do you do in your practice with medications? Yeah, so I try to ask about main offenders like NSAIDs. Ah, NSAIDs, the nephrologist's arch enemy. What most people don't appreciate about NSAIDs is that they can actually cause hyperkalemia even without AKI. Yes, exactly. NSAIDs decrease renin release, so less renin, less aldo, less potassium excretion. Sorry, Larissa, I interrupted you before. NSAIDs get me a little riled up. What else were you going to say? That's okay. They get me riled up too. I was going to mention other antibiotics that cause hyperkalemia, like TMP-SMX. It blocks potassium excretion in the collecting duct, and that builds up potassium in the body. So to recap, when you're going through the meds on a patient with hyperkalemia, sure, go ahead and stop the RAS inhibitor, but make sure you have a plan to get it back on board. Also, look out for NSAIDs and antibiotics like TMP-SMX. All right, Jeff, let's talk about the next step. What treatments can we start to get rid of the extra potassium? Sure. Well, everyone knows about diuretics, but we actually have to step away from the kidney to focus on the other way out of the body, the GI tract. Potassium binders work there. Yeah, we won't get into the mechanisms here, but they all work in slightly different places in the GI tract and use different ions in exchange for potassium. We're typically using potassium binders in people who can't excrete their potassium adequately. So think those with advancing CKD or those already on dialysis. Right. Let's start with the most senior of the binders, sodium polystyrene sulfonate, or SPS. You probably know it as kyxalate. So SPS has been around for a really long time. What's the data on that? So sadly, the data on SPS is mostly retrospective. Randomized controlled trials? None. Yeah, there was this one retrospective cohort study that looked at 1.8 million patients over age 66 that really made people's heads turn. Those who took SPS had higher rates of GI events when compared to controls, almost two times higher. And we're not talking about nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea here. These GI events were defined as intestinal ischemia, thrombosis, ulceration, perforation, resection, or ostomy. Serious stuff. Yeah, but for the most part, the side effects are rare. So you shouldn't be scared to give someone Kyxalate if this is what you have available to you where you work. The adverse effects are much more likely to happen in patients that have risk factors, such as active GI issues or past GI surgeries. Yeah, we should probably also mention that patients really don't like SPS. It tastes really gross. So many of them won't even take it on a regular basis. Right. And all of this was enough for the medical community to long for an alternative potassium binder. And finally, we have them. It took about 50 years, but now there are two different potassium binders, patiromere and sodium zirconium cyclosilicate. They are both FDA-approved and available to outpatients. But what do we need to know about them, Larissa? All right, let's take on patiromere first. This drug has a couple of important trials, all named after gemstones, amethyst, opal HK, and amber. And they all have slightly different designs, but all show that patiromere is effective at lowering potassium to normal levels. Key point here, a significant number of patients who received patiromere in these gemstone trials were able to stay on their ACE inhibitors, their ARBs, and their MRAs. Again, the medications that actually provide mortality and morbidity benefits. Mm -hmm. The main reported side effects of patiromere were hypomagnesemia and constipation, but they're not super common and are definitely reversible and manageable. Okay, and then there's sodium zirconium cyclosilicate, or SCC. These trial names have a bit more of an inspirational vibe, like harmonize and energize. This binder acts really fast. The data show that even after one dose, the potassium returned to the normal range in an average time of 2.2 hours. The main side effect with sodium zirconium cyclosilicate is in its name, sodium. Since it's delivered with sodium, SZC can cause edema. But this only happened in about 6 to 14% of patients that were actually getting higher doses of the medication. But what makes the nephrologist really happy is that the sodium doesn't actually lead to increased blood pressure in those who have edema. And when I ask my patients about the medication, they tell me SCC isn't hard to take and it's pretty much tasteless. The way you see these meds used in the real world might vary a lot. Dialysis patients might require it only on non-dialysis days versus your CKD patients who might be using it more frequently. 
and you can adjust the medication dosing every few weeks until the K is within the normal range. Yeah, and these two new options for potassium binder, pteromir and SEC, actually seem pretty great, especially compared to SPS. But they are the new kids on the block, so let me guess, are they really expensive? Mm Mm-hmm, they are expensive if they're not covered by insurance. But surprisingly, I'm finding that more insurance companies are covering them. I do sometimes have to jump through hoops to get it covered. But my big issue is this. Patients with significant hyperkalemia need the medication now, not like one to two days from now, just after the prior authorization finally comes through. Yeah, that's definitely frustrating. But then I also try to remember how costly and stressful those ED visits for high K can be. Yeah, yeah, that's true. All right, let's bring our discussion of K binders home. For SPS, they get a bed rep because their efficacy is not really clear, but their GI side effects are. However, keep in mind, this is a cheap medication and it might also be the only one available to you when you are in a bind. On the other hand, the newer potassium binders, Petiramir and SCC, look really promising. They really do work with minimal side effects. I'm using them more and more, especially for my patients who haven't tolerated RAS inhibitors because of hyperkalemia. I can start back their ACE inhibitor and let them eat a healthy diet again. And what are the cons? New drugs come with high cost and insurance coverage issues. It might not be on the formulary at many hostels at this point, but you can prescribe them as an outpatient. Okay, Larissa, I think that just about covers it. Shall we review? Let's do it. Oh, wait, hold up. Um, my pager is going off. Really? Now? Yeah. Oh, anyway, it's the lamp. Mm, looks like it's a K of 6.5 in this patient with diabetes and hypertension that we saw in clinic today. It looks like it was 4.8 on her last check just a few months ago. They say it's not hemolyzed. And, oh, I better call her. Wait, wait, this is perfect. Let's troubleshoot this hyperkalemia with our listeners. Yeah, okay, let's do it. All right, question one. Does she need to come into the emergency department? Is her potassium level too high? I would say yes. Based on our guidelines, her K greater than 6 is too high, and she needs to go to the ED and be assessed. In the ED, they can check a whole blood sample for the best accuracy. And even if the potassium is still high, we may not see EKG changes. And that's okay. The EKG is not a sensitive tool for detecting hyperkalemia. All right, question two. Should you call her and tell her all about a low potassium diet? Let's ask our discussant, Dr. Joshi, to weigh in. The renal diet that we have come to know and is taught and is recommended and you can order at any sort of health institution is wrong. And that is not evidence-based. It is frankly dangerous. And I think ultimately contributes to confusion and worsening of complications like uh, phosphate levels, acidosis, hyperfiltration, all these things. So in the end, I think we should feel more comfortable letting our patients eat some of these healthy foods that are good for their kidneys, eating more plant foods, being comfortable in counseling our patients, and then only really going into the weeds and telling people to cut back or make changes in their diet if they're starting to run into problems and if we are not contributing to those problems. Yep, I agree. I'm not a big fan of a dietary potassium restriction, but I do try to get a good dietary history. We should stress portion control and moderation of higher potassium foods, especially sauces, juices, and smoothies. And if she's eating a whole lot of one of these foods, she should cut that down. Nice. And finally, question number three. What are our potassium-reducing strategies for her as an outpatient? This is challenging, but we urge you to resist the temptation to stop those RAS inhibitors long-term. Reach for one of these new potassium binders instead, if available. Even though SPS might be less expensive, The GI side effects and that disgusting taste of the medication make it a less desirable choice for sure. The data just aren't there to support the widespread use of SPS anymore. Petiramir and SCC have been rigorously studied and are much more effective at reducing potassium. In her case, SCC might be the better choice now because of its rapid onset of action. That is, if you can get it covered through insurance quickly. Yeah, and with close follow-up, hopefully we can maintain her RAS inhibition. If you do have to stop any of the rest inhibitors while getting the potassium binder started, make sure you are prepared to start it back again soon. Okay, now I think you're ready to call your patient. Good luck. Thanks. Oh, hey, before we go, I have a potassium joke for you. You want to hear it? 
Na. Okay. America, we are endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. At Grand Canyon University, we believe in equal opportunity, and the American dream starts with purpose. To serve others in ways that promote human flourishing and create a ripple effect of transformation for generations to come, find your purpose at Grand Canyon University. Private. Christian. Affordable. Visit gcu.edu.